I was riding down the street today, and uh, I was about 45 degrees, and by the time I got home, it was 35 degrees. Uh, it's amazing. But, again, it just reminds me of the great power of God. It's possessed, it pertains to its control over everything. And so tonight we're going to continue to study the Word of God, but we're going to study the Word of God with that in mind, uh, that God's power is to accomplish whatever he wants, whether it be to get cold, get hot, get a wall built, get our lives transformed and changed, is always the same. Um, tonight we're going to continue in the book of uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. We have walked with Nehemiah for a whole chapter. He started off in early verses by um, inquiring of his homeland, his home people. Um, when he got the report that they were not doing well, he was he was he was saddened, he was frustrated, he was he was um, injured, and he cried and wept. But he did not stop there because he began to fast and pray. And in fasting and praying, he received the purpose of God and received the direction of God. And as a result, he began to do the work and the will of God. I, I don't know if there's anything more um, fulfilling as to be in the purpose and the will of God. I can't. I don't know. I mean, I, we, sometimes we can do some things that make us happy, but accomplishing the will of God is one of the most one of the more enjoyable things that has, that takes place in the life of a child of God. And, and Nehemiah uh, is, is an example and a demonstration of how this works. And I want to suggest as we continue to walk through this to see how God is able to transform anything. Us individually, the circumstances we change, we want to change, that need to be changed, and the world. And I say this again to remind us, as we prepare our hearts and minds to go back to the church, that we should prepare our hearts and minds with, with the fact that God is able to change us and change whatever needs to be changed. A few things we're going to look at tonight in chapter two, and we'll see a couple of things that kind of put us in the, let us understand that, that nothing is surprising to God, that we'll never slip something, nothing will ever slip past God because of God's omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence. I had this conversation with David about a young man, uh, and we were having a conversation about God's will, and he was saying that sometimes he wanted to, um, to, to quit. It was just too frustrating. and uh, Maybe he wanted to quit because there was there were so many obstacles in his way. But instead of quitting and, and quitting and backing off because of the obstacles, I told him when God gives you uh, direction, when God gives you instruction, uh, that it's actually safe. And I want to say this to everybody. It's safer to be where God wants us to be in his will, no matter how difficult it looks, than to be where we want to be. Um, by ourselves. So this reminds us. We're picking up in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, and I'll begin reading. We left off last night with the, por the portion of Scripture where we were, um, we heard that he had began the journey down to Judah, Jerusalem. He had began the journey, and in beginning the journey, he, at the very end of the session we stopped last night, around about verse 10, it gives us an, the identity of the enemies that were against the work of God. Now, it appears, if you just read it, that these two men, Sanballat and Tobiah, were um, uh, uh, they were against the, the Nehemiah or the people of God. But ultimately, their battle was with God. Let me say this again. When God gives you divine uh, appointment and divine direction, it's his divine direction. It's his divine um, protection that he provides when he gives us direction. Now, keeping that in mind, when you as a Christian say, I'm going to do what God tells me to do, enemies will come, but God will protect you. When the church steps out in boldness and says, we're going to do what God tells us to do no matter how popular it is, guess what? God protects us. When we seek to, to be transformed by communities, it's not that the community will always appreciate and approve it, but we are operating under God's divine protection as a, result, as a direction. As a result, we get protected. So verse 10 lets us know there's a man named Sam Ballard and Tobias. They heard about the action. And I found it interesting. They did not come to mess with Nehemiah when he was praying. They didn't come to mess with Nehemiah when he was talking about what he was going to do. They came to get on him when he began to do, take action. When we take action for God, enemies will come up. The Bible said it grieved them. They were just, they were saddened. They were horrified that somebody would come to take, to look out for Jerusalem, to look out for the, to seek the wealth of the people of Israel. And so there they are. Remember them. They're hanging right there like a dark cloud in chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 10. But let's go ahead and go forward tonight. Verse 11 says, so I came to Jerusalem was there three days. So Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem. He stays for three days. For those three days, it doesn't stay and suggest he did anything for those three days. But in verse 12, it tells us what happened next. And I rose in the night. So picture Nehemiah in Jerusalem with his, his traveling companions, the army uh, and the captains of the, and the soldiers that were sent to him with him by Artaxerxes. He is there for three days. He doesn't mention to them what the plan is. They don't know the plan. Uh, Aldous Xerxes doesn't know the plan. Even the people who are in, and remember now, there are some people that are actually in 
the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because they had come back to rebuild the temple. The temple was built, but the walls were down, okay? Remember that. They were there. He didn't go and tell them why he was there. He didn't tell his traveling companions was there. He just stayed in position for three days. So as I read this, and I read this one, I think I may have shared this previously. There are times in the life of the people of God where we, what we must do is to be silent and to be still. In other words, sometimes it's dangerous to share with others what God is telling you to do because everybody won't agree with it. Everybody won't see it because it's not their direction. It's not God's directing them. And so I find it interesting that Nehemiah took this position. He was, it, it, I'm guessing some of them probably thought he was there on vacation, just chilling. But he was waiting on God to make, give him his next move. And so that's what happens. He was there. He came to Jerusalem and he stayed three days before he did anything. On that third day, verse 12, he arose in the night. I and some few men with me. Neither told any I, any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So he didn't bring a traveling party with him. He didn't bring an army with him as, as if to say we're going to go to battle because it wasn't a battle. It was about it was a reconstruction that was taking place. So let me say that reconstruction. There need to be a rebuilding or a restoration of the walls. And that same picture uh, is the picture that we want to picture as it becomes, comes to our lives. Now, I want you to be thinking about this, our lives and then the life of the church in the life of the world. So three dimensions we're looking at, reconstruction. Reconstruction is not the same kind of uh, stance as a battle. A battle stance uh, has certain elements, and we'll see that a little later in this book. But a reconstructive stance has a insightful posture that we're looking and probing to see what needs to be done. So hold that thought. Let's go a little bit further. Um, he didn't tell any man what God had put in his heart to do with Jerusalem, neither was there any beast with him, save the beast that I wrote upon. Verse 13, he says, and I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates there were consumed with fire. Then he says, I went to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, where there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the back gate of the valley and so returned. So basically what this describes is Nehemiah um, went in a counterclockwise direction around the city. He took in, he went as far as he could go one way, but he couldn't go any further because of all of the damage and the, the rubble. So he turned back around and went around the other way to just to assess the damage, assess what needs to be done. Now, he had already asked um, Erdeserxes for a um, the, the timber, but it wasn't any point in just throwing timber up. He needs to probe. And that word, when he says view, it, it says here in in, um, in in verse 13, it says view the walls of the city. In Hebrew, that word is not just what we look at. It's like look. It's that he was actually probing. He was trying to find what the issues were, what the how how deep the damage was. And I'll say this: the reality is in our lives, it comes a time in the life of a child of God. We need to probe first of all ourselves. How many know sometimes you got to probe yourself? You got to check yourself out. You got to do an honest assessment of yourself. We do it all the time. We do it when we get dressed to go somewhere. We look at ourselves. For example, I make sure that there's no food stains on my clothes. I do that every day. Make sure because I'm, sometimes I'm good about getting breakfast on my shirt. Then sometimes we make sure that, that our coat, our dresses, our hats, whatever it is we're wearing, we want to make sure it's, it's right before we go anywhere. God wants us to do a spiritual probing or a spiritual assessment of our lives. Why? Because, listen, every one of us needs some kind of work, some kind of restructuring, a reconstruction of our lives. None of us are perfect, and we should always daily be aware that there's more work to be done. There's more work that God wants to do in us. But it comes first with us knowing that we need the work. Secondly, about assessing what we can see and then finally asking God to strengthen us and give us the capacity to be strengthened in that area. And then there's some times when you can't see, and but you ought to still be asking God to, 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 to help probe you, or help examine what's wrong. For example, if I go somewhere and I can't see, I'm, a few weeks ago I, I got a new, y'all probably see I got a new couple of little, little robes to wear when I preached. And and I was wearing it out for the first time, and it was all wrinkled in the back. Of course, I thought it was wrinkled. I asked somebody, I said, am I wrinkled? They said, yeah, so I had to pull it tight. I asked for help. God says, ask me for help so that you can see what's wrong, what needs to be done. Likewise with the church. As we come back, one of the things the leadership and myself will begin to do is, pro, is, is seek God. And God, what is it that we, we look around and say, God, what is it that we need to see so that we can be a better body of believers as we come back from this pandemic? God, what is it we need to do to come back? What is a probing to say what needs to be done? But we need to be insightful. We need to not rush into anything in our lives, but instead probe. Now, 
I want to be clear. This is not laziness. When you're asking God and when you're seeking to find out what's wrong, that's not laziness. That's simply the energy to make sure that you are where God wants you to be and make sure that you're capable of accomplishing what God wants you to accomplish. Nehemiah came down to rebuild the walls of the city. But it wasn't in a sense to rebuild the walls of the city without seeing what work needed to be done. That's, that's what the point is, and that's what we're saying about our lives. Let's not just race and do something. Let's ask God for his guidance. But when he gives it, let us apply what we learn and as we do our self-assessment and ask God to help us assess ourselves. How many know that all of us stand in need of some level of spiritual growth? Everybody know that? We need some spiritual growth. We all, all of you. You've been in church 40 years. You need pastor, deacon, deaconess, church teacher, whatever. We all stand in need of of, of of spiritual growth. So I want somebody that's out there saying, oh, I've got so much that work I need to do. We all have work that needs to be done, all of us. And so in that same vein, in that context, let us all be aware that we all just need to go and get an assessment, get an assessment regularly daily so that God can make us who he wants us to be. So let's go back to our text um, in, in verse um, 16. He said, as the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did, Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest of the, the, the work. He said, even as he assessed, even as he evaluated, even as he probed to see what damage was done to the walls, the Bible says that he, in verse 16, that he did not tell those who were in charge in Jerusalem. He did not tell um, the, the spiritual leadership of the, of the civil leadership, verse 16. He said he didn't tell the people who were out trying to do the work. He didn't tell anybody, um, anybody what his assessment was. Now, somebody might say, well, who did Nehemiah think he was coming down to? Somebody probably said that in Jerusalem. Who does he think he is? Well, Nehemiah was on divine assignment. And when you're on divine assignment, that leaves, that's work that, that, that needs to be done. And, and God sends you to do it. You have to keep that in your heart until God unfolds the rest of the plan. Again, this is not lazy. This is not laziness at all. What this is is being guided spiritually so that you can accomplish what we can accomplish, what God wants us to accomplish in our lives, in our church, and in this world. So he he didn't say anything purposefully because there was no God had at not yet given him the next instruction. If we look back to chapter 1 and early chapter 2, we see that he's a man of prayer. So he was praying all the time. And so as he prayed, he was trusting and believing that God was going to give him the plan. Today, as I was um, having a conversation, I began and am beginning to ask God about our return to sanctuary, our return to church, our return. And I will not move. We will not move until God gives the plan. The same thing should be true for every aspect of our lives. That we are patient but 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 probing, that we are insightful but accessible to God so that he can tell us what we need to do. All right, so verse 17, finally he began to talk. Verse 17, then said I unto them. In verse 16, he didn't tell anybody what was going on, but in verse 17, he begins to make, make share what it is that's about to happen. He said, you all see the distress that we are in. He said, you see our situation, how Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates are of a burn with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. So, obviously now the plan is in place, verse 17. And his appeal is not to cliques, it's not to groups, it's not to this person or that person. His appeal is to all those who had come back to Jerusalem with Ezra to rebuild the the the, the, the temple. He says, you see the situation we're in. We're, we're, we're vulnerable. Remember what I said, when there are no walls around the city, that city was vulnerable. When the wall, a city was not uh, safe because of the lack of, of walls, that city was uh, was a reproach. That means other nations looked down on that city aesthetically, but also other nations looked on that, down on that city because they knew that at any given time they could attack, steal, pillage, rob, take all the way from that city. I want us to be clear, um, the, the enemy, Satan himself, sees us when our walls are down. He sees us when we are not in the, in the, in the, the posture and position of, of trusting God. Can I say that? When we're not trusting God, the enemy sees us, and that's when he tries us. When we have doubt, can I tell you this? When we have doubts, that's our walls. Our walls, our walls, is, and our spiritual lives are not walls of, of, of material, they're walls of faith. When the enemy sees that our walls are weakened or they're down, he attacks us. Always know that when we are strong in our faith and we're strong in the study of God's word, when we're strong in our prayer, the enemy recognizes the enemy has to strategize a different strategy. But we're broken down, we're full of doubt, we're full of fear, we're full of what might happen and what bad might happen. The enemy will further goad us into being uh, fearful and living in fear. And remember this, we started off the summer with this. God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. But power, 
love and sound mind, a sound mind. And so this this is, this this declaration here that Nehemiah makes um, is a is a total call, all call to everybody to understand that the first thing that needs to be done is the walls to be built so they could be protected from the enemy. Likewise with us, that ought to be a call. That's my call tonight. Let us all be prayerful that God would develop our faith. Even as we study the word of God every night, let us pray even on our own after I've done my prayer. Lord, let this word rest in my heart. Let it grow in my heart that my faith will grow. Because as our faith grows, there's nothing in the world, there's nothing the enemy can do, can, can beat us as long as we have an intact, strong faith in God. Verse 18, he says, then he tells them of the hand, how, of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he has spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and be us, so they strengthen their hands for this good work. Let me break this down. He said, time to get up and build a wall. He said, you see the situation we're in. Come, let us um, build up the wall of Jerusalem, and we be no more approached. Now, I can imagine some people say, hmm, that's the idea. He didn't stop there. He said, let me tell you something else. The hand of God has been upon me. So that when I told the king, the king didn't just say, okay. The king sent men. He sent passports. And he sent material. So I'm telling y'all, this ain't just something I want to do. This is what God wants to be done. Oh, to be on the divine path of doing the work of God. Because as soon as he said that, they said as a group. Now, I want y'all to watch this because later on we'll see some of the challenges that come with restructuring, rebuilding, and restoring things in our lives. And But here they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthen their hands for this good work. It was good work. Why? Because it was from God. It was divine work. Why? Because it was from God. So they strengthened their hand. You know what that meant? They got ready. They got prepared. So let's picture them. The walls are down. The, the, the people that had hammers got hammers. The people that had nails got nails. The people that got, had screwdrivers got screwdrivers. The people that were, were, were made, so everybody that need, had work to do, they resolved in themselves. And what it means, strengthening their hand was a mental thing. They resolved in themselves, let us do this good work. Now, for us as Christians, there's two things. To, 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 to for restructuring and rebuilding of the faith in our lives and also to be a part of the rebuilding uh, process and the restructuring and restoring process of the church, we have to resolve ourselves that we're going to do our part. Can I say that? Now, I'm going to get pastoral here for a minute, if y'all don't mind. It is very easy for us to say what needs to be done. Matter of fact, one thing I learned in the past 17 years, that there's a whole lot of folk can tell you what's wrong, but there's a lot fewer people who really want to make a difference. Can I say that when I start getting too mad? You get a little mad, but not too mad. All right. There's a whole lot of folk that can assess the situation. There's a lot less folk who want to address the situation. And what this text lets us know is that these people, the people of that were in Jerusalem, uh, came together and resolved each of themselves. That they said, let us, let us, let us, let us. In other words, I'm going to do it. Can you join me? And I want us to have that same mindset. Let me go ahead and tell you what I'm asking about specifically. If you're a part of any ministry, whatever the ministry is, well, first of all, if you're not a part of any specific work, begin to pray and resolve yourself that you, when you're, when the time, you're going to do your work. That's the first thing, resolve it. I don't care what it is. And let me say this. It may not even be something that you did before. It may not be something that you um, thought you could do. It may be something that ain't being done. Three things. It may be the church of work. If you're physically challenged, maybe your work might be to write something. Maybe your work is to call somebody. Maybe your work is whatever the work is you got, God wants you to do. You got to talk to God. And then when he, when he says, this is what I want you to do, resolve yourself that you are going to do that work. Resolve yourself to do that work. All right? That's the first thing. And the second thing is that when you resolve yourself to do the work, then be ready to be active in that work. Let me go this a little bit further. Verse 17 and 18 uh, 16, 17, 18, uh, tell the story of what, from his silence to his declaration to the communal response to the challenge to rebuild the walls of, of Jerusalem. But in verse 19, we see what typically happens in these situations. But when Sambalat the Horonite, Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us. And say, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? So let me give you a breakdown of who was there. Uh, I don't know if Brother Jerry Brown probably on the phone, but these are, I don't want to say this, Sam Ballard, Tobiah, and Geshem. Geshem was a raven. Geshem, they, they're probably Muslim people, by the way. And this is not an attack on Muslims. I'm just saying these are people who do not understand the unique relationship that God's chosen people have with him. 
there's nobody really can understand what it's like to be a Christian except another Christian because God works in us. He speaks to us by his Holy Spirit. Nobody else can say the Holy Spirit speaks in them. God um, gives us his in, insight by the Holy Spirit. Nobody can say, well, my religion gives me insight. It doesn't exist. And so understand that as we do work for the king, our God, that we will find ourselves all times with enemies who look at things and see things a different way. It may be a different religion. It may just be somebody who don't know the Lord, somebody of the world. But the reality is they came in here in, in, in verse 19, and they laughed to scorn. Now, yeah, I, I know everybody remember I got somebody like this. Anybody ever had a bully, a bully in your life? Somebody, it might be when you're a kid, it might be when you're adult, but somebody who was a bully, who just always wanted to pick on you. They, 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 what they were trying to do was to try to make you afraid try to make you afraid to pursue whatever it was. I remember when I was in elementary school, um, there was a guy who was in my class because I was, I was not remember me, I was short for a long time. So the guy used to pick on me all the time. And um, and he somehow doesn't manage to get my lunch every day. He didn't have to take the lunch. He just smacked me around. He just, you know, you don't want that, boy. You know you don't want that that, that hamburger. Let me have your hamburger. And I'd be like, maybe I don't want the hamburger. And I'd give him my hamburger. And I remember finally coming home one day and I was hungry. Every day, my mom said, you ain't eating lunch. I said, no, nah, I'll be wanting my, my food. She said, what? So I told her the story about the boy who was taking my food. She said, that boy is taking your burger. You wanted that burger, and you eat that burger. Tomorrow, don't you give up your food. God is telling us the same thing. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what the enemy is saying. Don't be afraid of what other folks are saying. Don't let nobody take your hamburger. Don't let nobody take your joy. Don't let nobody take the purpose that God has called you to do. Be, be focused and recognize if God made that available to you, he wants you to have it. He wants you to do what he wants you to do with it. I, I can hear um, and then last, and some of the workers began to put down their weapons, but I can hear, uh, again, if you look at the next verse, we'll see. Some of them got frightened by the bully, um, San Ballard. Some of them got frightened by the bully, Tobias. Some of them got frightened by uh, Geesham and, and began to say, you know what? They're right. We can't do this. We can't get it done. But look at verse 20. Then I said, I them. Nehemiah had to stand up on behalf of God and say this. He said, I said to them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Here's what Nehemiah said. Listen, I hear y'all laughing, and, and I can see it now. Just as the people who were afraid were putting down their tools of, 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 of their tools of, of restructuring and restoration, he said, listen, I'm going to tell y'all right now that y'all ain't got no part in this, that God, the God of heaven, will prosper us. He will progress us. He will cause us for this work to be done. Therefore, we are his service, and we will arise and build. And I can imagine the people who are about to put down the hammers, pick the hammers back up because they knew that what they were doing was about to engage in kingdom building. Kingdom building work is work that that that, that, that strengthens our souls. Kingdom building work is work that draws others to Christ. Kingdom building work is work that transforms the world. Let us understand that we are on kingdom building work, and let us know that there will be some enemy, somebody out there who's going to tell us what can't be done, what we can't do, who's against us. But let us keep in mind that we are on the divine assignment from God. If you're a child of God, just the, the God of heaven will prosper us. Keep that in mind. You don't have to be stuck where you are because God wants to prosper you. You don't have to, We don't have to be the church be stuck in a place because God will prosper us. The world doesn't have to be ragged like it is because God will prosper the church as we seek to transform the world for him. I'm going to stop here tonight in the end of verse chapter 2. But I want us to just to watch again very carefully this blueprint for restoration, this blueprint for revival that God is laying forth for us as we prepare ourselves for the new time in the church, as we are stronger spiritually, as we're stronger in the church, and as we transform the world by the power of God. I know it sounds big, but I know what we preached yesterday. Yesterday we said sometimes we, we, if we open our mouths, God will give us more than we can handle. Let us be expecting God to do great things in our lives. Let us expect God to do great things in the life of the church, and let us expect God to do great things in the world. I'll stop tonight. Now, we got 18 folks here on Zoom, and I'm asking y'all pastorally, don't hang up till I say goodnight on phone Zoom. And phone, y'all don't hang up till I say I love you and goodnight to y'all. I want to close out tonight together. Amen? Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just say thank you tonight for just the love and the kindness that you showed to us. We thank you again for the blueprint that you're giving us to to be strengthened individually, strengthened as a body of believers, and then strengthened as the and strengthened that we can do your work in this world. God, we know and we want your kingdom to come. We want your will to be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And we're praying that you would use us, guide us, purpose us, strengthen us, that we, your world can be accomplished in our lives. I pray, God, tonight that every household will be blessed. I pray, God, that every family will be blessed. I pray, God, that every individual will be blessed. I pray, God, that all of us will live in the expectation of your great work in our lives. Then, God, I pray that you would let your word get in our ears, our feet, our heart, our mind, our mouths, our lips, our tongues, and our vocal cords, so we can be prepared, capable, and even ready, and even declaring your word to a dying world, just like me and my dear to say, the, the, the Lord God of heaven will prosper us. Let us declare to each other, when we get weak in our journey, let us declare to each other, the Lord God will prosper us. And then when we look at ourselves in the mirror some days and say, I can't, let us say, the Lord God will prosper me. Bless us, keep us, Lord, by your love and power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hold on, Zoom. God bless you, phone line. I love you. Amen. 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 Amen.